Good afternoon to you. 306 here, News Talk 105.9 WMAL, where we're making sense of the news. Coming up this hour, we'll talk to Jennifer Gallardi from the Epic Times. And in a piece today in The Federalist, she writes about why are all of the anti Israel lunatics so ugly, so physically ugly? What is that? Well, there's a reason for that. She'll explain. That's coming up at 3 30. A scientific explanation for that. Julie Kelly joins us at 4 o'clock today. We talked to her about some breaking news involving the FBI and the planting of evidence when it comes to their effort to take down Donald Trump. And Andrew Kerr is here from the Washington Free Beacon at 5 o'clock. He's got an update us for us on uh, a congressman by the name of David Trone. You might be interested in this update. It's all ahead. You can join us, 888-630-9625, 888-630-WMAL. The Julie Kelly interview, I'm very much looking forward to, again, coming up at 4 o'clock. Uh, and, and here's why. Because on Friday, Jack Smith admitted, his team admitted in a court filing in this Biden administration, Donald Trump document dis dispute that's obviously playing out in courts now uh, as they try and charge Trump with various crimes over this dispute. Uh, it, it, the court filing revealed that the FBI and uh, Jack Smith have completely mishandled all of the evidence in this case. They acknowledged that they had lied to the court. They, they said they, they had accidentally represented to the court that the documents were all in the same order, that they were found inside the boxes at Mar-a-Lago, when in fact they've all been jumbled up. And uh, they admitted in a court filing hoping that the judge, Judge Eileen Cannon, would go easy on them. Uh, sorry, we misrepresented that detail to you before. So, uh, you know, as a non-lawyer, when you when you hear a story like this, you think, well, isn't evidence supposed to be preserved? Isn't the idea that you're supposed to preserve it as best you can in the form that you found it, including the way it was all laid out? Because there might be meaningful stories told about how that evidence is all put together and why it's all in the same box, why it's in that order. Well, that's all disrupted by the way that the United States federal government has handled all of this. And in fact, Perhaps more importantly, and I'll, I'll let Julie Kelly assess the the importance of all of these revelations, but perhaps more importantly, do you remember the photo that they took inside Mar-a-Lago of all of the documents spread out on the ground? The FBI snapping a bunch of pictures in Mar-a-Lago and making it appear to the public, the impression that was immediately left to the public was that Donald Trump was so reckless with classified information that he was spreading classified documents all over the floor like a like a child that doesn't clean its his room uh, just spread out all over the ground and uh, it just so happens that if there's all these these classified doc, uh, uh, document covers all over the documents on top of them just laying out just splayed across the ground boy how reckless is he and so they take a bunch of pictures and they submit it inside of the indictment, in other words, to the court as a piece of evidence against him. This is So they're representing to the court, look at all these things we found. And then they're representing to the public, look what a slob he is. Look how reckless he is with classified information. Now, obviously, there's a bunch of things that are relevant here that should be remembered, including he was president of the United States. He had classification and declassification authority. We've talked to many expert guests already on this subject that presidents have broad power to make personal uh, of a wide array of documents from their time in office. And it ha as a matter of a routine occurrence, former presidents of the United States do take uh, keepsakes and mementos and documents from their time in office. Uh, and this is, of course, never been an issue until the left sought to use it against Trump in a criminal way because they're trying to interfere in the election, quite obviously. So, again, all of that stipulated. But what we're learning now, according to this FBI filing from this Jack Smith filing from Friday, is that those cover sheets, the ones that claimed this document's classified, this document's classified, classification documents on top, cover sheets, the FBI brought those. They were not at Mar-a-Lago. Those sheets of paper seen in that photo were not at Mar-a-Lago at all to begin with. They, those sheets of paper were brought by the Federal Bureau of Investigation during the raid of Mar-a-Lago and planted on top of the documents or in lieu of documents and then photographed and then submitted in official court filings as if they represented real evidence of something. What is that to you? What is that to any fair thinking person? Looks to me like planting evidence. Did they drop a bag of cocaine and a gun as well? 
and take pictures of that. Look what we found at the crime scene. And so these are things at this late date that are still coming out about this saga. None of which is all that surprising given the relentless politicization and selective prosecution we've seen at the hands of an out-of-control deep state and especially during the Biden administration. And by way of comparison, let me invoke for you the treatment of Joe Biden, which matters. It's not enough to call it hypocrisy, but it is enough to, to point to the basics here that it's quite obviously politicized. It's selective, the treatment. In Robert Hur's report absolving Joe Biden of any guilt for having stolen documents while he was a vice president and senator of the United States of America, again, not afforded the same presidential privileges a president of the United States would have when handling documents like this. Um, in that report, remember, Robert Hur says he's not charging him with anything and uh, wouldn't recommend charges anyway because he's an elderly man with a poor memory. A sympathetic, is that the word? Sympathetic elderly man with a poor memory. Uh, so therefore, no jury would find him guilty because he's too, he's too incompetent to stand trial. That's what the plain language is, which is insane. So if he's too incompetent to stand trial, he shouldn't be president of the United States. The guy can't lead dogs. He can't lead a country. There's all sorts of obvious things going on that suggest that Joe Biden should not be in the position he's in, including his efforts to speak English on a daily basis. But here you have Robert Hur saying he shouldn't be charged. But don't miss this other detail from his report. There were photos. There were pictures of document storage, the way that Biden handled the documents that he stole from the American people. And how did he handle them? He left them in the garage, left them at the Penn Center, left them at all these various locations all over the place, totally mishandled, totally unsecure, available to the prying eyes of anybody who doesn't have security clearances to see. He shouldn't have had it in the first place. Endless documents matching that description. And the photographs were merely of the outsides of the boxes. There they are over there. There they are over, over there. In other words, the evidence that was gathered in the report and then used by Robert Hur to say he shouldn't be charged at all was the way they found the documents in the first place, in the same positions they found them in. So the photographs were preserving the way the evidence presented itself at each of these crime scenes. They did not give Joe Biden the Donald Trump treatment. They didn't take the documents out and spread them on the, on the hood of Biden's Corvette to accentuate the bizarre nature in which he kept these documents in his garage alongside of his classic Corvette. They didn't do that. They didn't bring cover sheets with them, classified cover sheets, to lay them down on top of all of the documents and then to subsequently take photos of them and then present them to the American people as evidence that, look, he mishandled all this classified information. Look, we put classified cover sheets on top of all of these documents. We brought them with us. They didn't do that. They didn't, they didn't do any of that for Joe. In fact, they orchestrated a cover-up and a rationale by which he wouldn't be charged or couldn't be charged beyond his time in office. That's the way the cover-up went. And so here we now, we now find out in Trump's case, yet another indignity, yet another abuse, yet another violation, the FBI brought props with them in order to stage photos at a, quote, crime scene that they had arranged of Donald Trump. How many more stories do we need to hear like this? Where the FBI is cooking up a rationale for why somebody should be charged with a crime. You remember the Gretchen Whitmer fednapping hoax? This idea that there were all these Trump supporters looking to kidnap the lunatic governor of Michigan? And it turned out the entire kidnapping party was composed of federal officials except for like two suckers who were entrapped into it. We're like, you gotta go over there. I don't think that's a good idea. Oh, you're gonna go over there. Okay. And they do. And bam, got them. We caught somebody who was attempting to kidnap Gretchen Whitmer, who planned out the kidnapping. The, the feds planned out the whole thing. That's why we call it the Fed napping. It was used in order to scare the—it was an, inter, an election interference scheme is what it was. It was meant to suggest that, oh, look at these radicals, these right-wingers. People are plotting the kidnapping of a Democrat governor, a beloved Democratic governor here in the United States of America. It was a hoax. 
It was a hoax. And so coming up at 4 o'clock, Julie Kelly is going to join us. We'll talk about the details of this. Um, and uh, to what extent is Eileen Cannon going to suffer any of this as the judge who's handling this case? It, it seems, uh, you know, she she has been apparently tough on them uh, throughout this. Um, in fact, she, uh, according to Julie Kelly's uh, tweets on the subject, ex-posts, she said, based on the new revelations of evidence disruption and potential tampering, Judge Cannon has postponed a key deadline in the classified documents case. She says this is related to special guidance in classified docs matters. She's done with Jack Smith's game playing. So I'm, I'm hoping that there is, uh, that, that Julie Kelly is right about that, that, um, that there are going to be some consequences here, or at least that Eileen Cannon is going to handle this uh, aggressively because she should. She really should. Let me take a phone call from Sam in Alexandria, line one. Sam, good afternoon. You're on the Vince Colony Show. Hey, brother. I appreciate you uh, bringing me on. Uh, in this particular case, like I told uh, your call screener, I have to disagree with the characterization. Now, I don't know anything more than what you just explained, but I would say that it was using the term planting evidence, I think, is a reach at this point. If uh, if I were, to, let's say, if I were going on this quote-unquote raid, and my expectation would be there are classified documents, then I would certainly bring cover sheets. So if I were taking photographs, then especially photographs that were going to be put into the public, then it's appropriate to put a cover sheet on it. But Sam, uh, so Sam, but you, yeah. Sam, neither neither of us have X-ray vision. If they just left the documents inside of the box and took a photo of the box, that would serve the purpose, and then they could present the evidence in court. Yes, indeed, these documents are are classified. Instead, what the FBI undertook was an effort to spread the documents out, stage a photo with them, bring cover sheets in order to convey some immense gravity to a an apparent an alleged crime they were accusing Trump of. Uh, and they represented it to the court and to the American people as if that's the way they found those documents. It's only this late in the legal process that they finally revealed, actually, we brought the cover sheets. So why would you conceal that from the American people up until now, were it not for the fact that you were trying to leave them with an impression that wasn't true? Uh, and I can understand that side of the argument that you're presenting. Uh, I would say that, uh, again, uh, it's the inference of that there is, quote unquote, uh, evidence tam tampering or planting evidence, uh, whereas I could see that if they were doing inventory, that they would definitely lay them out in some respect. Now, I'm not standing up for one side or the other on this. This is just my perspective sitting back, listening to the listening to this story, you know, for the first time. Yeah. So, you know, that's that's all I can bring to it is, you know. Being in that position, if I were, how, why would I bring the, you know, cover sheets or whatever? And that would be if I'm taking photographs, documenting them, and you don't want something to leak out like, oh, look, they left a, you know, a uh, uh, classified document, took a photograph, and now it's out in the public. Right. Now, look, the inference, the inference side that I get is if that were an Applebee's menu and they laid the cover sheet on it, yeah, and that's that I would say is a significant issue. Yeah, but but the other piece is like we've seen many uh, classified documents photographed and released through the years where redactions are made. So, for instance, when the White House releases a photo from the Situation Room of the president sitting around with his advisors, handle like watching some raid or something, like you know whether it was the Bin Laden uh, raid or whatever it is. They always go in and they edit the photo. They will remove all of the markings from the pictures. They use Photoshop to, to brush it out. The FBI in its and, and other federal agencies, when they remove information, when they block it from public sites, sometimes it's not even that sophisticated. They just put giant black boxes over everything. You can't see this because of this reason. Uh, those options were available to the FBI. That's not what they did here. They created an imp a false impression by bringing things that weren't there. So that's why I'm saying they're planting evidence. But uh, I'll say two things. One, Sam, you, I always appreciate your calls because they're, they're always so good. So I appreciate that. And two, I encourage you Thanks. to listen to Julie Kelly coming up at the top of the hour. And maybe she will uh, give us both a better perspective on what we're dealing with here. 
Oh, absolutely. And I, I do appreciate that last part you threw in about if you take a picture of a quote unquote crime scene and you have, let, let's say, blood splattered everywhere, then that gives the inference that this was a yeah. huge bloody messy right. fight usually you don't uh, assume the fbi it, brought a, a, a like a paint can with them and started throwing it all over the place that's that typically not the assumption correct. you would make all right hey correct. sam thank in you this case documents yes thank yes, you sir. very thank much you. we, we got to run but uh hey nick is he on the phone i'm wondering if it's us or him oh, there we go hey, nick can you hear me now hunting down uh, yeah, did you say Percival or Huntingtown? I said Percival. That's you, brother. Yeah, uh, this is Nick from Huntingtown. Hey, oh, oh, okay, Percival Huntingtown. Well, I'm sorry. It's the wrong thing on my yeah. screen, so now we're no, good. No, 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 that, that's okay. That's okay, and I know you're backed up against a break, but like I was telling Corey, you know, I, I, you know we can disagree with semantics or, 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 you know, planning evidence or whatever. I got to disagree with your previous caller, though, because they tried to paint Donald Trump in the worst possible light taking the photos out, putting the classified documents. I did not read the her report, but I've seen plenty of pictures of the boxes in the cor in next to the Corvette. I don't think in the her report they took out every document no. and put a, a classified cover sheet on it. So, you know, it, it, they purposefully did that because that's exactly what they wanted to show the public that he was reckless, but not 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 Joe. No, no sir. Yes, so they wanted to invent an image that didn't exist. So they brought props with them. Uh, Nick, thank you. It's, yes, sir. That's, uh, that's a conversation we're going to have coming up with Julie Kelly at 4 o'clock. On the other side of this news break, we have Jennifer Gallardi here. She's noticed that a lot of the people taking down the American flag and lifting the Palestinian one over these college campuses are fat and unhappy. Why is that? Correlation? Causation? Well, we explore it next. Hey, good afternoon to you. It is 335 here, News Talk 105.9 WMAL. Coming up, Julie Kelly's here, 4 o'clock. We talked to her about the latest revelations involving the FBI and that document dispute with Donald Trump. And then Andrew Kerr is here at 5 o'clock from the Washington Free Beacon. He's got some brand new reporting on David Trone. And you can chat with us at 888-630-9625, 888-630-WMAL. If you've been watching these out-of-control left-wing commie campus protests all across the country, and you've been thinking the same thing I've been thinking, which is, where are all the hot chicks? Why can't any of these dudes throw a football? Well, you're not alone. We're not alone uh, in that thought. Uh, it is It is a bit weird. We've been watching uh, as uh, as people who are, they don't seem to really like themselves that much and are pretty unsightly are out there in the streets pulling down American flags and screaming at the rest of us. Here, for instance, is one example. This is a fat lady at Princeton who declared that she was starting a hunger strike, uh, and she'll, she'll be fine, uh, but in, in solidarity with Palestine. Any people of conscience in the Princeton community, students, faculty, alumni, to participate with the striking students in a solidarity fast. In just the last few hours, we've had commitments from at least six people from Princeton Theological Seminary participate in this solidarity fast with more coming in by the hour. At the seminary, we've also been calling our school to disclose and divest for the last several years and want to join together with the students from the university in their hunger strike. Okay, hunger strike for the students. Uh, and usually these hunger strikes last like six hours and then they're over. Um, let me bring in an expert on on health and on this subject. Jennifer Gallardi is here. She's a health, culture, and policy reporter for the Epic Times, and she has a great column in The Federalist today called Fat, unhappy campus protesters should try lifting weights and eating a burger. Jennifer, good to have you with us. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. So is there a relationship between these two things? People who, they don't seem to have a lot of, like, you know, self-esteem and, uh, and or a lot of self-respect, it seems like. I mean, I think there is. I lived out in Los Angeles for a long time, and I understand that pressure, you know, to be, to look a, a certain way that society praises you and upholds you. You know, we're very deep into popular culture, the movies and entertainment. We see these beautiful women and there is some of that pressure to, for, particularly for women, to conform yeah. to a certain body shape and be thin. So I, 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 that's not unjustified. I understand that. I was in front of a camera for a lot of my career and there, there is a lot of pressure. I went the other way. I, 
I kind of overexercised. I just tried to make myself thinner all the time and, and conform. Mm -hmm. These people have just completely thrown in the towel and like, well, screw you all. We, we don't think your, you know, um, society standards so, are praiseworthy or anything. So we're just going to be fat and lazy. Plus, they've been given everything. I mean, particularly these students at Columbia and Harvard, right? They've been given everything. They've probably never had to work a day in their life. They've never faced any real hardship or struggle besides maybe being misgendered. Um, and they need to pick up some sort of cause to feel righteous. And like their life has meaning. So, but, you That's know, it what was, I see. what's interesting, I think you're right. We can go to the extreme in either direction. But I, I think that uh, one of the features here of the American left is they're so opposed to rules and order of any kind that right. they're willing to take it out on their own bodies. Like, I don't want to live up to any standard yeah. is, is the message I'm getting from someone who chops off half their hair and dyes what remains purple. Yeah, it's a nihilism. I mean, th there there is some sort of. It was kind of with the, the, the late feminist movements in the 70s with um, Simone de Beauvoir and, and that Harvey Mansfield called it a womanly nihilism. Like anything is preferable to being a woman, right? Like everything that goes along with being a woman, we're going to cut out. And anything is preferable, even a man. We'd rather be a man than be a woman. And it's the same kind of thing I think we're seeing here. There's a nihilism. There's destructivism. It's absolutely not life-giving. It's life-destroying. And everything it touches, it destroys. Now, then including themselves in their own body. Now, now misery, uh, the phrase is misery loves company. To what extent is yeah. our miserable people just simply evangelizing their their self-loathing? They're trying to bring other people into that same feeling. Absolutely. I mean, social media has just, you know, magnified that by a hundred times. And you see, particularly in the gender cult, these trans people, they're going for children. They're going for the vulnerable, the people that feel disenfranchised by whatever rules society has set. Um, and we have parents going along with it. So instead of teaching their kids, these are actually praiseworthy things. You don't have to be a beauty queen, but it's good to take care of yourself. And it's good to hold yourself up to standards and strive for something, right, and attain a goal, um, which is the fasting thing is hilarious. Like you said, the last maybe six hours. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just got off the, I'm Orthodox. I just got off the 40 day Lent and I didn't make it, you know? <laughs> so It's tough. Um, it's tough. But I, I just yeah, was laughing really at hard. the, uh, at the, uh, the young people, the young adults who, uh, took over that building at Columbia. And then before a full day had even lapsed, were standing on the steps claiming that they needed, uh, uh official food deliveries from <laughs> the university or else the people inside were going to quote starve to death. I was like, what, I believe they what do you think this is? Humanitarian aid is what they need. They wanted humanitarian aid in the form of vegan food. It's unbelievable. And so, so yeah. you you point out in your excellent column today for the Federalist that that physical health is a really important predicate to feeling good mentally. And I could, I that the case for that seems yes. really simple to me. Anytime I've ever undertook undertaken any exercise whatsoever, I do feel better mentally after it's over. Yes. Yeah. Well, part of it is the is the overcoming challenges, right? People know that when you, oh gosh, I don't want to get up, but I do it. And I put myself through something hard, maybe first thing in the morning. I think Joe Rogan was making a case for like making everybody go on a run. Um, I said this about COVID, like, why don't, instead of locking people in our homes, we make people go out and get 10,000 steps a day. That's your booster shot, right? Yes. Like, um, so doing something hard first thing in the day kind of sets you up and like, eh, you know, nothing could have been as hard as getting up at 4.30 or 5. And, and, and that kind of um, feeling of accomplishment, right, of doing something hard or really, really trying to fast, yes. actually. And is, earning. Is really, and, and, yeah, and earning something. But then there's also the, all the proof that comes out about metabolic health. And with an increased level of protein intake and more muscle mass, you don't your your blood sugar doesn't fluctuate. You don't have the same emotional swings. You feel more steady through the day. You don't have these caffeine crashes and then need caffeine. I mean, there's so many studies on this and so many positive mental benefits from just eating real food instead of this Franken food that's being pushed out and crickets and Lord knows what else they're coming <laughs> with, up with in labs. <laughs> And nourishing yourself and just, again, you don't have to go to these extremes. You don't have to do cold plunges and saunas every day. You don't have to intermittent fast. For most people, just the small tweaks in their lifestyle and their habits would, would do wonders for their sleep. You know, turn off your phone at 9 p.m. Yes. It's just, 
it can be really simple. It doesn't have to be complicated. Yeah, for sure, for sure. You know, you you were mentioning uh, you mentioned Joe Rogan. I think it was on his show that I had heard uh, somebody basically lay out that uh, you know Gatorade. Anybody could buy a Gatorade. You can go into a store. You could buy a Gatorade. And I, I have. I've done this. And you just crack it open and you drink it. It's fine. It's it's what you wanted. You got a Gatorade. But there's nothing like yeah. drinking a Gatorade after you're done immense physical exertion. Like, or like you, yeah. you you go on the hike, you get to the top of the mountain, you crack open the Gatorade, you drink it. You've earned it. You've earned it. Your body can tell. And those are like kind of the sweet moments in life where you earn the respite and it kind of gives you a perspective, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, for me, it was always a beer. I don't drink that much, but I lived in Colorado for a summer and there was nothing for me like a cold beer and a burger after a five hour hike, Nice, you know, in the mountains, in the altitude. And I didn't do that every day. Right. Um, and, and I'm very cautious to, you know, cause people are like, well, burger and fries. I'm like, no, 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 like real meat. You know, I, I'm not big on the industrial farming. It's the way our food supply is right now is terrible. Um, it's all processed, but you know, to make the best choices around the types of food you eat. Of course, I would say not a Gatorade, but maybe like some really cold water with um, <laughs> some electrolytes in it. Because Gatorade's mostly corn syrup, but or a sure. coconut water, right? you know, a coconut water. But your point, I get your point, is like it tastes better once you've worked for it. And like I said, to tie it back to these students, I don't think they've worked for anything a day in their life. Um, so it's just they don't understand that struggle reward system. They don't understand the, the concept of delayed gratification, um, which something like real fasting does or any of anything that's worth doing, to be honest. Yes, yes. And and, and engaging in a routine uh, workout pattern or any sort of disciplined uh, self-improvement is the kind of thing that, that has uh, far, farther reaching benefits, doesn't it? In terms of just like structuring your life and helping you to succeed and thinking long-term, uh, all of those things are associated, correct? Yeah. I mean, you think about um, what we're seeing on the college campus, it's complete chaos. There's no order. There's no systematic, this is what I do now. It's what I, I do, whatever I want, whenever I want. I mean, did you see the list of demands? They're like, we want the morning after pill. We want you know, HIV tests. What are you doing in there? <laughs> what, what is the need? Like, we want lotion without sunscreen. This is all very bizarre. It's this, like, no structure, all chaos. Um, and I kind of lived, not to this extent, but I had that life in L.A., and, and this is kind of speaks to some other pieces I've written for The Federalist, but I had a life that was very much I was living for myself. I could travel whenever I want. I didn't even have a pet. I was like a free spirit. And you realize that that is so unstable. I was mentally unstable. I was not happy. My life looked really nice on Facebook, hmm. um, but it wasn't fulfilling. And you need boundaries. I think humans need boundaries. We need, this is why I promote, you know, I think we need to have the churches go back to some form of religion and not just like a woke Jesus or exactly. what I call therapeutic Jesus. Yeah, the job of the church like, is to make the world more like, more godly, not to make to the church more worldly. Correct. And God is order. You know, you don't even have to call it God. You could call it natural order, yeah. natural law, right? There's order in nature. I'm just looking out on this, out my backyard, which is a lot of land and trees. There's order there. And there's no order into anything we're seeing in any of these far left progressive movements. It's so, all chaos and destruction. So from time to time, uh, and it's usually conservative websites that'll point this out. They're like, you know, conservatives are so much hotter. <laughs> they'll, they'll they'll put a they'll yeah. put pictures up and they'll be like, look at this. But to, basically, what I'm hearing from you is that there is a bit of a science to that. There, there's a kind of a legitimate case to be made that uh, yeah. people who are 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 basically have their lives together are happier, more well-adjusted and more likely to prefer order and, uh, and less government. Yeah. I think there's, um, a uh, self-responsibility. Um, I think again, you do see this sort of self-loathing on the left, like that they're projecting out to the world and they want to blame somebody. They want to blame the patriarchy. They want to blame, um, colonialism. They're always looking for somebody or something to blame. Whereas, uh, you know, again, I can say this because I was on the left. Right. I don't, we didn't talk about the, that transition, but I kind of found my way. I went, returned to Christianity. I had some order brought back in my life. I always had fitness in my life. That was my career, maybe my saving grace, to be honest. Um, but, 
you know, there, there's a self-respect, there's a respect for the body in all concern. And like I said before, things that are life giving, right? You, you, you want to have a good quality of life and you do the things you sacrifice the, the instantaneous pleasures for, for a better quality of life down the road. Because you have a sense of self-determination and, and you have a sense of agency yeah. and like, I can actually agency, do something sure. and when things are going wrong, it's not everybody else's fault all the time. So it, and sometimes it's your fault. Sometimes it's my fault. I, I screwed up and I should fix that. Uh, that's that's right. a sentiment I think people on the right recognize. Yeah, and we see this on the left. The, the victimization is just, everybody's a victim. You're, you're constantly, and where you are on the, hierarchy of victimhood depends on your intersectionality. Are you a woman? Okay. Women used to be pretty high up there. We're getting lower um, on the status. I mean, you have to be trans. You have to be all these other things before. Now look what they're doing with Title IX and everything. I mean, yes. they're completely denigrating. Men, men are taking those jobs now. Those. Exactly. I thought they hated the patriarchy, you know, <laughs> so it's, it's just an upside down world. And I think um, it was <laughs> Here's here's the benefit of this is these people probably won't reproduce. Mm. Um, they're so sexually confused and and I mean again although I heard what they asked for that list of demands with HIV so I'm like well maybe they are I don't know what they're doing. I know that, well that but. that strikes me as similar to what we heard during um, Occupy Wall Street too in Zuccotti Park in New York that there were so many sexually sexual assaults they had to establish women mm -hmm. women only tents to protect the women inside the encampment. It's like at some point, there's your sign. Like, get out of there. Yeah, I don't know if they'll do that here. I mean, again, I think there's 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 been a a, a weird acceleration of particularly with this gender stuff. I mean, I don't know I don't know what they're doing in there. Um, but I, at some point, this is a this is a fringe minority. It really is yeah. that these elite institutions. Um, I don't think parents are going to be sending their kids here anymore. So they're going to eat their own eventually. So uh, That's one, how I see it. one one last point I want to I want to piggyback off something yeah. you just said, which is that I guess the silver lining is that the people aren't going to reproduce. And and I I think conservatives will often tell themselves that as kind of a way to comfort themselves about the chaos of the moment. Like, OK, these people are so yeah. crazy. It's like a self extinction that's going on. And that's true to an extent. The only thing that I do think, though, that that matters here is even like the most conservative families who think that they did everything right to raise their children, once the left and these institutions get a hold of those kids, they really do a number mm -hmm. on them. And it's, so mm -hmm. if they're not doing mm -hmm. it to their own kids, they're definitely doing it to everybody else's. Well, and I think that we're, we're also seeing a shift in, um, in undergrad schools where parents are taking their kids out of that. And I think there is going to be a re reformation, reformation, either back to classical education, to Waldorf schools, to homeschooling. Yeah. I think things have to collapse in order for something else to be kind of rebuilt and reborn. I just listened to this podcast with um, Tucker Carlson was talking to this guy. I never knew who he was, but he had this comedy website around frats, fraternity behavior. And he like having sex with like he was like i got, got to be a famous author on oh college yeah his Facebook. name is his name is tucker max actually max. they're the they're the yeah. only two tuckers i'm aware of that are not dogs they're both uh <laughs> tucker max and tucker carlson and yeah but he's like turned his life he's a homesteader now like he bought land he's saying these are my children this is how i want to i mean if that someone like that can turn around and say I live for my children. They don't belong to the state. Yes. I move to a community where we're growing our own food. You don't have to be a doomsday person. You yes. just kind of have to go back to the basics of community. Um, and, and I think we are seeing a move to that. It's good. It's a good I think point. The question is, yeah, is will it will it happen quick enough? Yeah. Before our, all of these things collapse. This story is not over yet. We're still writing it. Uh, thank you very yes. much, Jennifer Gallardi. So nice to talk to you. Uh, please come back again you sometime too. soon. Thank you very much. Absolutely. And coming up on the Vince Colonnais show, the great Julie Kelly is going to be stopping by just a few minutes from now. We'll get the latest from her on all of the ways that the feds, the Biden administration have been manipulating the evidence in order to take down Joe Biden's political opponent, Donald Trump. Some shocking new court filings. Julie Kelly reviews those coming up.